Hi, my friends. Anne Louise Gittleman here with another episode of the First Lady of Nutrition podcast. And today we're going to be talking about the contagion myth, why viruses, including the coronavirus, are not the cause of disease. And I have two very special guests, Dr. Thomas Cowan and Sally Fallon Morell who are both very, very well known. They're actually superstars in the health sphere. And I want to welcome them both to the podcast. Hello, Dr. Cowan, Tom, and hello to Sally Fallon Morell. Hi. Hi. There. Hi. So there's this new wonderful book out called The Contagion Myth. And Dr. Cowan, if you'll start by telling us why viruses are not viruses and why they're not the cause of disease. What, why should people buy this book? I know that it's a tremendous bestseller, but what has been the real, I would say, the real forceful drive for people to buy the book? I mean, it's a great question. I, I think for me, it's, you know, let, let me just say, in some ways, I was as shocked and surprised to come to the conclusions that I did as anybody. I mean, you know, I'm, sort of trained as a medical doctor and you know go through the whole thing and we learned a certain thing and even though i've spent most of my career you know in a sense debunking or not believing in the normal narrative you know i wrote a book the heart doesn't pump the blood and cancer is not a genetic disease and vaccines aren't very good um this was a sort of huge shock to me in a way because but but what ended up happening was when I looked through the science to to ask to try to answer the question: Have we really proven that viruses, in particular, and also bacteria, when isolated, actually cause disease? And what I found is the actual proof and the evidence for this isn't there. Uh, once you see that you have to start asking yourself the question, you know, what are bacteria and viruses doing there? You know, they're obviously, if you have a strep throat, you have bacteria there. And when you have chicken pox, you have viruses there. But, but what I found is there's, there's a sort of evolution. You know, when people uh, formulated the germ theory originally with bacteria, they thought that the only bacteria inside a living person or animal was a pathogen, right? There was no other bacteria in us, but that those bacteria that come from the outside to make us sick. Sure. Now, 150 years later, everybody would say that's ridiculous because 99 plus percent at least are from us. And the same thing is happening with viruses. Now we, or 10 years ago, we thought the only viruses in us were from the outside and they're making us sick. And now we know that, we're, we're, that, that our DNA is basically viruses and we make these things called exosomes which protect us from sickness. And so, you know, in 50 years, everybody will know that viruses come from the inside. They're actually exosomes or these particles we make to help us, and we will stop thinking this nonsense that these things are making us sick. So then my question to you or to you both at this point is, so what was the environmental or the outside influence that triggered something like the Wuhan virus? Well, one thing we share in the book is the epidemiology of the deployment of 5G, which is the fifth generation wireless technology, which started in Wuhan. The Wuhan was the first place to deploy this. And they turned on uh, 10,000 base stations at the same time. Uh, this is uh, the first place this happened. And it was also far more base stations than we actually had in the whole United States at that time. Mm. And suddenly people uh, got very sick. If you look at some of these videos, which of course they say are, um, misinformation, fake news, or whatever. You look at these videos, people fell down in the streets. They looked like they were having seizures. They were like shaking all over and, and then they died. <clears throat> so uh, one of the th things that I think separates us from the other people who are trying to debunk the virus thing is that we are not saying that this is 
uh, overblown. We are not saying that it's not serious. We're not saying it's just a bad case of the flu that was not treated properly in the hospitals. We think we have a very serious situation on our hands, which could kill millions of people. But as long as we're focused on a supposed virus, we're not going to solve it. And as you can imagine, there's some very uh, strong commercial interests who don't want us to know that 5G uh, is probably dangerous for us. So then the question is, has there been any precedent for this before? I mean, we've had the flu of 1918. I'm sure there have been other flu epidemics. Has there been any connection between EMFs or electricity or the like and the spread of the so-called flu or the virus that actually isn't a virus that may be related to the electrification of the country? Well, actually, we, we, all, we start with this. We talk about the Spanish flu of 1918, mm. and it killed 50 million people worldwide. And um, the health authorities tried to prove that it was contagious. They did contagion studies where they put healthy people uh, in the same room with sick people. They got them real close together. They breathed on the sick people, breathed on the well people. They took blood from the sick people and injected it into the well people. They took um, you know, secretions and subjected them into the well people, and they could not make a well person sick from this. And uh, th that was great mystery uh, at the time and remained a mystery and really until Arthur Furstenberg's book, The Invisible Rainbow, came out. Mm. And there he talks about the rollout of various um, types of EMF, electricity and so forth, and the Spanish flu was when they installed radio antenna worldwide and starting on the military basis. So the military people were the most, most affected. Now there were some iatrogenic uh, things going on too. The military people had been vaccinated to the hilt and then people took a lot of aspirin, which didn't help the situation. But uh, uh, aspirin and vaccinations didn't make them sick. It was this uh, rollout of the, the radio. So we're facing this rollout of 5G, Tom. Why is 5G different than any of these other rollouts, so to speak? Why is it more dangerous to the cell, to the biology of the human design, so to speak, than 2G, 3G, or 4G? I mean, they're all dangerous. And it isn't just 5G, but 5G is a little bit different. But they're all dangerous and, it, and really it's just an accumulation with a little bit of an added twist. But, but I would say that if, if people want to think about why man-made electromagnetic fields are, are harmful to life, the, the way to think of it is, you know, we are electrical beings. We basically, the, the um, essentially we're organized living water that accepts the electromagnetic field from the sun and the moon and the earth and your friends and your dog and everything and converts that into light. Now, when you look at all those things I just mentioned, the sun and the earth and, and your friend and holding hands, and these are all a sort of exposure to electrical or, you know, electric magnetic fields but they're all non-pulsed and they're sort of broad spectrum. In other words, there's no specific frequency. So we're sort of bathed in this non-pulsed electrical field. Now, when you come along and you say, I want to use a certain frequency to have an effect. So I want to tune my radio to, to the frequency of 98.6 or something then you have to actually just use that frequency. You can't tune your radio to just frequencies. And so now, instead of being exposed to like a, a broad way of eating, you're just eating, you know, French fries. And you're just essentially bombarding the tissues with this one pulsed frequency. And that's the difference between a toxin that's an EMF toxin versus you know, like an insecticide or something. Because an insecticide, it's not, the purpose is not to kill human tissue. But with, with man-made electrical frequencies, the, 
the purpose of it is to expose everything to these pulsed, very specific frequencies. And now we know that they have a toxic biological effect. Now, when you get to 5G, it has, uh, and, and this research was done by the Russians, it was done by the U.S. Naval Intelligence Service in the 70s. Right. The millimeter waves have two very specific effects. One is they interfere with the availability of the oxygen in the, in, in the atmosphere. And two, they essentially poison the mitochondria so that we can't turn uh, oxygen and food into energy. And then when you look at the main symptoms of, of what we're calling COVID-19, which is not a viral illness, but we see hypoxia and then a hyperinflammatory or cytokine storm, they call it. Uh, that's the third thing that happens specifically with exposure to millimeter waves. So you see hypoxia because it interferes with the oxygen in the environment. It, and it interferes with the body's ability to turn oxygen into energy. And that also creates an inflammatory cascade. And so that is specific to the illness. Now, I just want to say also that we, we have the epidemiology and we have the mechanism for how 5G frequencies um, actually cause disease. But I would love to see actual formal trials by independent researchers. I'd be happy to be on the panel to set up the experiment because we need, you know, we need real science to confirm that this is in fact what we're seeing. And so I'm actually, and I think Sally agrees, we're actually calling, let's investigate this. And while we're at it, let's investigate glyphosate, let's investigate air pollution, mm -hmm. let's investigate polyunsaturated you know, uh, oils in the diet. Let's investigate a lot of things because we spent $50 billion investigating a virus and we can't find it. So is anybody else looking at this connection, the EMF slash 5G wireless connection to the virus? Are you, are you two the it's real pioneers? It's not the virus. Uh, I, I just want to correct you mm -hmm. there because it's important correction. Because people have said that I say that millimeter waves cre uh, cause the virus. That's not the case. What they do is they cause the illness. There's a difference there. So is anybody looking at that connection of the causation of the illness? Uh, there was a study by an Italian guy who was the head of dermatology for an entire region of Italy. And he actually uh, demonstrated in this paper that millimeter waves uh, such as are used in 5G causes a similar physiological response that we see in COVID-19 and actually causes the body to create these protective exosomes, which are identical to what we're erroneously calling the coronavirus. Uh, unfortunately, the paper was up, uh, published in a peer-reviewed journal for about two hours, at which point it was, he was threatened and his co-author was threatened and they took the paper down and it hasn't been seen since, except I had a copy of it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so this is what's going on in this day and age. So do we see a connection between 5G and the causation of the illness or, or the viral um, manifestations in some of the areas where there's been heavy COVID uh, caseloads? I know New York is a 5G city, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's kind of followed the rollout of 5G especially in areas with a lot of air pollution because uh, air pollution seems to exacerbate the effects of these tiny millimeter waves. So first Wuhan, and then it was um, the cities of Europe, especially those that had a lot of air pollution. Uh, one interesting factoid is that the nation that's had the most COVID cases per number of people in the country is the little country of San Marino mm. on the coast of Italy. And uh, they've had 5G the longest. They were the first European country to have it and they've had it the longest and they have the most cases. Uh, then of course, we saw the so-called outbreaks in 
uh, New York. And as 5G has been rolled out throughout the country and first in big cities and then in smaller cities, uh, you've seen this spread. And uh, of course, this is being blamed on an infectious virus. But it's like a cover up. It's, so people really won't look at the, um, you know, what's really causing this. So and, can we, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sally, can we say that these are just symptomatic of radiation sickness? Yeah, it's radiation poisoning. I, you know, the other people who are very sensitive uh, get sick from 4G and 3G and being around a cell phone. Uh, and by the way, I've had a couple people tell me they got the new 5G phones and they can't use them because when they put their hand up to hold it, their hand feels extremely strange and you, they have to uh, pull it back and take it away. So it's not just the 5G that's going to the phones, it's what the, fi what the phones are emitting also. So we're living in a soup of electromagnetic pollution. What else is the 5G doing to us? So it's activating these already existing virus. Well, well no, it's yeah, it's so hard to get out of virus. Yeah, it's so hard to get out of talking about a virus, but it's poisoning our cells. It's causing the cells to break down. And when that happens, the body produces these exosomes. These are identical in appearance and size and receptors and everything to viruses and so, so it's actually so to, to be clear we're activating something that's already intrinsic to the cell and the cell makes these like they're like little uh packets that grab uh dead tissue they grab toxins and they take them out of the cell but in addition they go and lock onto other cells and tell them hey we've got a problem here well, let's see if we can adjust to this and you know, we have adjusted to radio waves pretty much, um, except for a few very sensitive people. And we've adjusted to a lot of other things. But the question is, will we adjust to 5G? And that's a little bit more problematic. Tom, you wanted to say something to clarify my misconception. Yeah, we're not, it's, it's not that 5G or millimeter waves cause a virus, they cause an illness. The illness is essentially hypoxia and, and a breakdown of the tissue, including the genetic material that gets packaged up. Come, and so these things we're calling viruses are actually internally generated particles from the inside. And let me just read a quote from a recently published paper in the, you know, the, the main journal of virologists, which is appropriately called viruses. Mm. This was about uh, exosomes, and I won't go too much into this, but here's a quote. However, to date, quote, however, to date, a reliable method that can just actually guarantee a complete separation of viruses from exosomes or extracellular ve vesicles does not exist. Now, if you think about this, we can, uh, one of the examples I use is, you know, we can separate one molecule of caffeine out of coffee. We can separate using modern, you know, chemical techniques, literally one molecule of anything from anything else. But the only time we can't separate a molecule of one thing from another is obviously because they're the same thing. Any, anything that's a thing, meaning a chair or a book or a foot or a person or a virus or a bacteria, unless somebody doesn't think a virus is a thing, like you can't separate love from, from goodwill, right? Because it's not a thing. But a virus you can separate uh, easily. And the only reason you can't separate a virus, which is from the outside, from an exosome, which is from the inside, is because they're all exosomes from the inside and you can't separate something from itself. <laughs> and they won't accept that yet. No. Because it's, it's it, too big of a conceptual I mean, shift from yeah. paradigm it, it shift. All viruses are pathogens mm. to now they're all generated from the inside, period. And, and you know, Anne Louise, when you see pictures, you can, there are, you go on the internet, you can see uh 
electron microscope photos of things that look like viruses. They're round and they have little things, fuzzy things poking out of them. And they're at, you often see them at the edge of the cell, but you also see them inside the cell. You see them outside the cell. But these are dead photographs. They're not living things. Now, the conventional view is that these come from the outside of the cell and somehow get into the cell and then they reproduce and take over the genetic material of our cell. But you can easily, just as easily say that these viruses you see at the edge of the cell have come from the inside. You, you don't know from the photograph. No, you don't know from the photograph. But what I'm wrapping my mind around is you both have you know, eloquently stated is that this really represents a whole paradigm shift, doesn't it? Yes, it absolutely does. And it's very hard to step out of it. In fact, I'm having, a... I'm having trouble. <laughs> I can imagine how the rest of my people are going to be feeling. I was just it. going over a letter I got from somebody, an email, and she was chiding me for this. And she said, uh, of course, the viruses cause disease. Uh, she was talking about people who got TB from bad food and crowded living conditions, and then they got the virus that caused TB, or uh, rabbits who were overcrowded, they got this virus that causes myxomatosis. But the thing is, you don't need that virus as part of the explanation. She'd already given the explanation yes. for food and overcrowding. Why do you need a virus in there uh, when uh, a, a much more uh, rational assumption is that the body is doing it the best it can and it's creating these little particles to uh, try to help you adjust to these terrible conditions. And, and Luis, let me, let me give you an, another example of this, which I, I've probably gotten a hundred <laughs> emails from people about this, right? So yes. there's the famous story of, I can't remember his first name, Simmelweis. Oh yes. The, oh yes. The famous doctor who, who revolutionized medicine because he discovered that that germs cause you know childbirth fever or whatever that's called so here's here's the story so at the time the doctors of that time were doing autopsies on you know you do autopsies on people who died usually of a disease they were using formaldehyde uh, to embalm the the, the person and so basically they were going right from the, uh, from the autopsy room. So their hands were covered with blood and disease tissue and formaldehyde and God knows what. And they stuck their hands without washing them into the open cervix mm -hmm. of a woman who, in labor. And the woman sometimes got sick. Uh. Now, you mean to tell me, not you, but that that proves it was a bacteria? I mean, first of all, you know, there is something called serum sickness, which is you don't put serum from one person untyped into another person. You certainly don't put diseased tissue and formaldehyde into the open uh, uterus of a woman in labor. Now, yes. I would agree if they if they had isolated the bacteria from the, on their hands and injected that into the open uterus and caused it, I would say yes, that was it was the bacteria. But they never did that, and nobody has ever done that. And so it's not like I'm against washing one's hands, right? I, I'm not I'm not for doing an autopsy and bathing your hands in formaldehyde and sticking that up a woman's uterus. Like, I don't like that. <laughs> but I don't think it proves that it's a bacteria. No, very much so. But you know, this just makes me think, and I'm, I'm thinking again of this paradigm shift that is apparently necessary in understanding what's going on now with the pandemic. So it kind of speaks to what Louis Pasteur is credited with saying on his deathbed that it's the germ is nothing, it's the terrain. Am I on the right track with that? Right. And uh, the terrain determines the bacteria. I mean, if the terrain is a certain pH, you're going to get this type of bacteria. If the terrain is a certain type of dying tissue, you're going to get this bacteria. And, but Pasteur said uh, every disease has a specific bacteria. And this 
germ theory or, or is caused by a specific bacteria and this germ theory has hindered progress yes uh, uh, for example uh scurvy was considered an infectious disease caused by some kind of bacteria uh, for centuries or for decades anyway um, after all people on the ship they all got sick and then when they got off the ship and went their way they, they got well again so doesn't that tell you it's infectious well what there's other explanations and the main one is that they were not getting vitamin c in their diets but the germ theory had such a powerful hold on the medical profession that it took a long time to for this to break through. Same thing with pellagra, that was considered an infectious uh, disease until they finally showed it was a B vitamin deficient. Yes, so, so this is exactly what needs to happen. So in the book, you make a case for a paradigm shift, I take it. Absolutely, like we've had a paradigm shift on bacteria. I mean, Tom can tell you when he was started out in as a doctor, uh, when somebody was sick, they tried to sterilize them. You know, they uh, gave them really strong antibiotics and um, usually made the patient worse. But now we know that bacteria are, we're dependent on bacteria. We couldn't live without bacteria. And a healthy person has six pounds of bacteria in the intestinal tract that do all sorts of wonderful things for us. So we just need, we've had that paradigm shift uh, except for a few people still in the FDA and the USDA. Uh, uh, and again, we're not saying we shouldn't be clean. Uh, we definitely need to be sanitary because filthy conditions uh, will uh, breed bacteria that produce toxins. It's the toxins that, that kill people or make them sick. But in so, any event, so we, need this, uh, we need this paradigm shift for viruses now that we've had it for... Um, bacteria. Yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. So there really needs to be a kind of movement, a revolution, so to speak, mm -hmm. where we do more serious research. I mean, how can we prevent exposure to all the 5G, 3G, 2G, and accumulation of all the electromagnetics we're exposed to? Do you present a, a kind of program in that regard? Well, we definitely recommend limiting your exposure as much as possible, especially in your house and in your sleeping space, because when you sleep, that's when you recover. So uh, we recommend that you have a wired internet, that you don't have Wi-Fi in your house, uh, you know, very limited use of your cell phone and never up to your ear. Uh, even uh, things, simple things, and this has to do with electricity, not uh, Wi-Fi, is uh, unplug the electric alarm clock right by your head, in your bed. Um, one of the things we're concerned about is the uh, all the electrical gadgets and the Wi-Fi and uh, you know everything going on in hospitals, um, because that's just going to make you worse. What does one do? You know, I wrote a book about this. You and I were speaking before we started doing our our interview, and I wrote a book about this called Zapped many many years ago. It was a little before its time. I have a habit of doing that. And the public was just not ready to hear what I had to say, but I have a list of all the supplements, the foods, the spices that are healthy. In your research, what have you found is the best way to kind of zap the electrical influence of the toxic environment? Well, as Tom says, you want to keep the water in your body as structured as possible because that water really acts as a wire, as wiring in your body. So uh, that means having good... Um, 30 cell membranes. So the first thing we focus on is the polyunsaturated oils, the uh, industrial seed oils, which of course we're all encouraged to consume and which is in all processed food because these are unsaturated and they basically turn, make your cell membranes kind of floppy and leaky. And that's when you're gonna be, it's like you're gonna have a lot of sparking in there because of poor insulation. Yes. Broken wires. More susceptible. Yes. Are there any particular vitamins or minerals, Tom, that you feel are important to kind of keep the cell membrane and the integrity of the internal uh, minerals intact? I know there's a lot of calcium dysregulation that occurs when you're exposed to EMFs. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, as Sally said, um, we are uh, basically coherent or structured water compartments. 
Uh, an example of this that I gave in the book is if you look at the lens of an eye, uh, you look at it, it's basically just organized crystalline water. And then you can, and so it, the function of it or the form of it is based on what it's supposed to do, which is be transparent to light. And then you put in uh, certain frequencies or certain toxins and it disrupts the crystalline nature. And now all of a sudden it's, you know, opaque. And so the light doesn't get through. And then you go to the eye doctor and he says, you have a cataract. You say, why do I have a cataract? And he has no idea. But basically what's happened is it's, you've disorganized the crystal. And so now it's a, it's got, you know, as they used to say in Yiddish, it's got schmutz in it. And so it do, the light doesn't go through. And that in a sense is what disease is all about. So, you know, it's partly avoidance, you know, you don't, uh, you, you get as few toxins as possible. And, you know, when people say to me, so Tom, you mean I should read labels on my food? And I always say no, because <laughs> if it has a label, don't eat it. Oh, very good. <laughs> um, and, you know, you avoid uh, non-native electromagnetic fields. You make sure you have enough minerals. You make sure you have, you know, enough sunlight exposure because that's the healthy fields. You know, you eat either pasture-raised uh, lard or pasture-raised raw butter. Uh, I don't know if that's quite the way to say it, but I think everybody knows what I mean. Yes. Butter, raw butter from cows that were raised on pasture. You eat eggs from chickens that were raised on pasture. These create, give you the raw materials that living beings and humans have, you know, turned into healthy bodies for long as we've been around. And that's the basis of this. There is no magic medicine for this. There are some medicines that help and reduce, you know, help uh, with hypoxia and help increase oxygenation. But, but that's not really the thing to focus on. We need a combination of avoidance and, you know, connection with the sun and the earth and friends and loved ones and children and good food and raising chickens and you know we need a different way of life here <laughs> so what about the concept of earthing you know i when yeah. i wrote totally. to you many years ago I, I i made the acquaintance of clint ober and i i was very very engaged and enthralled and fascinated with the concept of grounding yourself is that something that you're a believer in a hundred percent because we 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 know that you know we is back as my heart book, I said, here's the, here's the experiment that proves this. You take a tube that's hydrophilic and you suspend it horizontally in a beaker of water and it will start flowing in the tube. And that's because there's a, uh, this, the water by its nature separates charges and creates an electromagnetic field that creates flow. Now, here's what you can do. You can take this beaker of water, you can measure the flow so you know what the velocity is. Then you put it in a lead box and it stops flowing. Then you take it out of the box, you shine the sun on it and it starts flowing again. And then you put the beaker of water on the earth like you described and it starts flowing. You put, it, you put your hands on it. And so now we know what laying on of hands was all about and the electromagnetic field from one human to the water starts it flowing. And then you put your dog, or as I say, most dogs, next <laughs> to it, and it'll start flowing. But here's the hooker. If you put your cell phone, lean it against the beaker, it will stop flowing. Mm. So that's all you need to know. The earth makes your, your, your water structured. It creates circulation, it creates health. That's called grounding. And your cell phone makes your water coherence deteriorate. Millimeter waves make it deteriorate more than any other electromagnetic fields we know of. Oh, and that's a kicker. That creates disintegration of the tissue. 
So both of you are pioneers, you're visionaries. Can you tell my listeners a little bit about your background, which enabled you to think outside the box? I mean, <laughs> Sally, you've been very influential in putting a magnifying glass on the toxicity of certain kinds of soy products and canola oil, very specifically. And, oh, and oh. also in promoting uh, raw milk, which is very shocking to To a lot of people. So, and by the way, raw milk is your best source of glutathione, which is a real help in keeping you detoxified you know every day and also it's a great source of zinc too and you uh, zinc seems to be a real key mineral in in uh, in the immunity and and just helping uh, protect you against this so so Uh, what well (laughs) how did you come how did you come to all this i mean you've been a bit of a whistleblower in in, in only the nicest (laughs) way so how did you come to all this in your career well it's a long story but i in 1996 i wrote the book nourishing traditions which has sold almost a million copies well not a million but maybe eight hundred thousand. pretty close when you count the uh, you know uh, all the forms of the book but uh it was um, it was like the universe made me do it. I kept getting pushed to do this. And then um, I would say that I'm a very methodical person. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do this about traditional foods, I've got to look into everything, not just the meats and the organ meats, but the milk, what was traditional milk, um, grains, how do we prepare our grains, fermented foods, what kind of salt. So I've tried to be consistent uh, throughout the book in applying traditional methods to the way uh, we pr- should prepare our food. So anyway, and it was Tom was <laughs> the very first person to contact me with uh, support uh, for the book. And we've been collaborating ever since. We've written two other books together. Which are? And, uh, um, the Nourishing Traditions Book of Baby and Child Care and The Fourfold Path to Healing. Mm. And then uh, Tom <laughs> sent me an email one day saying, I think we need to write a book on this. And uh, I would written a blog that went kind of viral and he had uh, a little talk on uh, YouTube that went viral. So I said, yeah, I think you're right. And um, we, we actually wrote the book in about two months. We, we knew it had to come out. Oh my <laughs> goodness, that's quite a feat. That's quite a feat. Dr. And by, the, and by the way, as you know, the book was banned on Amazon before it even came out. The conta- um, we're talking now about the contagion myth. The contagion myth. Uh, it's been a little bit hard to get. Uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, in principle, carries it. But Barnes & Noble has been hacked. And they're trying to recover from this. And uh, so if you go to their website, it says that it's not in stock. But oh, Books yeah. a Million has it and is fulfilling orders. And then Tom's website, drtomcowan.com, is also fulfilling orders for the book. Thank you for that. And your publisher is Skyhorse Publishing? Yes, yes. Lovely. They, we, they've been great. They respected the book. They didn't try to change it. And, you know, I've seen publishers just ruin a book. Uh, yes. Because they don't understand it or whatever. But... So uh, we don't know how many books have sold, but it's definitely created a buzz. Um, People in Europe and Canada are having a hard time getting it. Uh, Apple, you can download it from Apple or Apple iPhone um, in Canada and Europe. So one way or another, you can get it. So what do people do who are interested in your foundation? Tell us a little bit about Weston Price. So uh, Tom and I were original founding board members, and we have a great website, Uh, westonaprice.org. We publish a quarterly journal that's been on the forefront of this whole message that um, the dangers of EMF and the the problems with the germ theory of disease. And if you're a member, uh, you can receive the journal Uh, We also have local chapters all over the United States and the world who can help you find these very foods that Tom is talking about, uh, pastured animal foods, uh, raw milk. uh, So find a local chapter and they can help you find these foods. Excellent. And and Dr. Tom, you came to this, I mean, you were were trained conventionally. 
Yeah, I have a, I, I have a little story if I can, if I, I, it's, I don't think even Sally has ever heard me tell this story as to <laughs> why I just, why I could choose to take on the medical community. Yes, let's this hear is, it. This is a theory, but it's, I'm, I'm sticking with it. So when I grew up, my family uh, was part of a, a very strong Jewish community of very high powered and successful um, you know, people. And a lot of them were very well known doctors, including the doctor who invented the laser for treating gynecological problems. Mm. And there was a doctor who was head of oncology for Southern Michigan and, and the head of you know, urology. So I, I, I grew up like every Sunday we had picnics with these like, you know, 10 of the most well-known doctors in Southern Michigan. And what I noticed was they cared much more about golf than they did about their doctors. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and we were all part of this golf club. And when, and when I was 15 and they were, they all geared their entire summer for playing in the club championship of this golf tournament. And when I was 15, that was the age where they let, they let me start playing in this tournament. So I'm 15. And at the time, I, I would say erroneously equated the ability to play golf with intelligence. <laughs> and, and I happened to be a very good golfer. And I beat every one of them and won the club championship when I was 15, which had never happened before. My goodness. And I remember saying to myself, I'm smarter than all these guys. I mean, I probably wasn't, but I didn't know that. I, what I knew is I could intimidate them on the golf course. And that gave me the sense that I don't need to worry. I don't need to be intimidated by credentials or fame or <laughs> any of this stuff, because I was better at this thing than, that they cared more than anything about. I, I actually quit playing golf because I didn't really like it after that. Huh. Uh, but it, it taught me a lesson that I think has really You've never forgotten. My life. Yes. So, so you have stick. written you have written how many books yourself, Tom? Uh, two books with Sally, uh, one book on golf that never got published. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, three books with Chelsea Green on the heart and then vaccines and then uh, cancer. And then this one with Skyhorse, who I also agree have been really helpful and we're happy to be working with them. Wonderful publisher. So what is your hope for the contagion myth as we round out our and, and kind of come to an end with our First Lady of Nutrition podcast? What do you hope, what do you hope to accomplish? that the, the, the world has to change. You know, and I had a friend the other day who said to me, well, Tom, you knew the world was gonna change and this is better than a nuclear war. So that's true. The world has to change. We have to realize that this strategy of poisoning ourselves, poisoning our food, poisoning the air, poisoning human relations, poisoning our relation with animals, Poisoning the environment, the space we live under is actually not going to work. <laughs> and, it, it, and if we keep doing that, we're, it's not going to go well. And I don't think the general human being wants to do that. But I actually think that we're under a spell. And I talked about this in the, in the, in the story of Sleeping Beauty or Briar Rose that this has been something that humans have been aware of, that you can be under the spell of materialism, that you think there's only physical substance in, that exists, and therefore you're afraid of life. And we can't do that anymore. And we're either gonna learn that with this you know, event, or we're not gonna go well. That's all there is to it. Well said. And Sally, what do you hope? Well, I, I love Tom's metaphor of the prince uh, hacking through all the briars to get to the princess. 
Uh, it's the marriage of the spirit and the soul. And the spirit is the thinking part of our bodies. The, and the soul is the feeling and the loving part. And uh, we've been, there's been this terrible divorce for so many years uh, since the scientific revolution. And the scientific revolution brought us many good things that reduced the drudgery in our lives and so forth. But we definitely need to have this marriage of soul and spirit and have a soul-filled um, practice of medicine, a soul-filled education, soul-filled soul arts. And uh, we hope that this book will play a part in that uh, waking up, that it's just got to happen. Or as Tom says, we're, it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well. So yeah. books, books yeah. a million is where people can get the book, Sally. Books a million and uh, drtomcowan.com. Dr. Tom, you had something to say. Well, actually, I, I actually want to uh, correct a, one little thing that Sally just said. Because oh, okay. I think it's important, if you don't mind. Not at all. Because I think if I, my reading of the story is the prince actually didn't have to hack his way through the thorns. The prince, they asked the prince, well, if you go there to try to save the princess, you're going to die like all the other people who tried to save the princess. And the prince said to his family and people, no, I'm not, because I'm not afraid. And then when he went to the castle, which was engulfed in this toxic thorns, the thorns parted for him and let, let him go and find the princess. So he didn't actually have to hack his way through the thorns because once you have no fear in your heart, the thorns have no power over you. That's mm. right. That's right. Yeah. So, so here's to fearlessness on all levels, wouldn't we agree? <laughs> but, but unfortunately, the medical science today makes everybody afraid in this. Yeah whole, I mean, when you read these descriptions of how this virus is going to invade your cells and set up nurseries to divide and multiply and hack into your genetic makeup, I mean, this isn't science. This is, you know, this is horror story fiction. This is yeah. And Halloween this disease, stuff. Yeah. This disease is actually at its core, not, not 5G. It's not bad food. It's just Plain old fear. I don't disagree one iota, and I want to thank you both for being my guest today. Um, this has been very, how shall we say, enlightening on all the, in all the best ways. So I'm going to thank you both, Dr. Thomas Cowan, Sally Fallon, Morrell, and I want to thank all of my listeners for tuning in once again to the First Lady of Nutrition podcast because this episode has been brought to you by Unikey Health Systems, my go-to supplement company for the best healthy aging, detox, and women's and health products on the planet. So thank you once again. Many blessings. Shalom, shalom. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Louise here with just one more thing. Thank you so much for being a fan of my work. And if you like this video, please check out all my other videos. Please subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications.